adventure. <laughs> um, it's nice having your your range kind of give a little base yeah. to the. I try not to do the same range. At first, I can't do that. And two, um, I don't know. I like to. No, I think that's good. Thanks. Um, so I we stand up here for that thought, I think, right? Yeah. So basically, you'll. Uh, after I pray, you'll go down for a minute, and then during like the passing of the peace, you'll come back up and sit in a place, and then after the doxology, you go back and sit until after the sermon. Okay, so yeah. saying, saying, stay up here, go down, yeah. go down, stay down, come up, or shake, come up, once I come up in the... I usually shake like a two or three people's hands and then I come up. Kind okay. Of thing. Yeah. And we're coming up here before we, we're also involved in the call. Like we're standing up here when for you, the call. When you see me start to welcome, start coming up, yeah. Okay.
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Trinity. We're so glad to have you here this morning as we come together, joining our hearts in worship. Um, we want to welcome everyone joining us online as well as all everyone here in the house, especially those that this is your first time with us. We're excited that you're with us. We're, we feel like God is doing something special here. God is at work here. Matter of fact, I was, I was coming out of Bible study on Wednesday night this last week. And I was getting into my car, and I saw somebody sitting on their steps across the street, across Pulaski, and I thought I saw a wave, and I kind of waved back and got in my car. And then about 30 seconds later, the, that gentleman was at my window. Hello. And so I got out, and I said, hey, how are you doing? And he said, I just want you to know that I'm noticing. I just want you to know that I, I'm sitting here, and I watched, and I see people come in and out, and I notice how you welcome people. I notice how what you're doing for those in our community that are overlooked. And I thought, praise God, because when you are about God's business and you are following the will of the Holy Spirit, things are a little bit different. People tend to notice. When we love the way that Jesus loves, people tend to notice. And so we celebrate that together. We hope that as you're here this morning, you experience that love, you experience that embrace, you experience that open door. Uh, we've been talking about prayer for the last, uh, we started last week, we're continuing on, and, and the question we talk about this morning is, God, where are you? Because we acknowledge that sometimes God feels very far away, but I pray this morning, as you worship, that God will, will feel very near, that you'll experience God's love in a very real and tangible way. So I invite you to join me to stand this morning um, as we join in the call to worship. So would you stand to your feet if you're, as you're able? And the call to worship, it's our first opportunity to come together, to join our hearts together, no matter where we've come from, no matter where we've been. You're welcome in this place, and you're welcome to participate in worship this morning. So as you see your part come up on the screen, you're invited to join in. So come, let us worship and bow down in awe of God's steadfast love for us. For God gives ear to our words. God listens to the sound of our cries. Come, let us take refuge in the God of our salvation. For God is our shield, our protection in times of trouble. Come, let us sing praises to our God who listens. Do you believe that this morning, that God listens, that when we sing, um, you might say, well, I don't have a really great, really great voice. God does not care about that. I don't necessarily have the greatest voice, and I'm on the mic this morning. So, uh, so feel free to join in with whatever you have because God is hearing us and God is just so pleased to have us gathered together this morning. So let's give him all the praise as we ask for him to give us vision this morning. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, save that thou art. Jesus is here this morning. 
needed assurance Jesus is mine Oh, what a foretaste Of glory divine Heir of salvation Purchase of God Born of His Spirit Washed in His blood perfect, perfect. perfect submission All is at rest I and my Savior Am happy and blessed Watching and waiting Looking above with his goodness lost in his love this is my story this is my song praising my savior all the day long this is my story this is my song Savior all the day long. As we sing to a Savior, Jesus Christ, we're going to lift up His name this morning. Oh, what a Savior, wonderful Jesus. Oh, what a Savior, wonderful Jesus. Oh, what a Savior, Wonderful Jesus, oh, what a Savior, wonderful Jesus, oh, what a Savior, wonderful Jesus, death could not hold you, you are victorious, praise to the Savior, wonderful Jesus, oh, what a Savior, wonderful Jesus, oh, what a Savior, wonderful Jesus, oh, what a Savior, Jesus. You saved us. You went to the cross. You paid for our sin. You came out of that tomb victorious. We declare it. Even if we see all the brokenness in our world, the brokenness in our lives, that doesn't mean that you're not on the throne, Jesus, because you are. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and you have reached out your hand of fellowship. You have opened your arms of redemption. You only invite us to allow you to rescue us, Lord, to move in our hearts, to move in our lives, to purify us. So, Jesus, would you come and work this morning in my life, in our lives, Lord? We so desperately need you. We need your salvation. We need your grace. We need your love. Build this place that we might not keep it to ourselves, but we might carry it with us wherever we go today. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Good morning. We're glad you're all here worshiping with us today. We offer you a warm welcome from our church family. Uh, if you could take a, uh, some time to pass the black book down the row if you have not already. Those of you worshiping with us online, if you could fill out the um, Connect card online. And those of you in the pew, there's a blue Connect card. We ask that you fill that out, and there's a box in the back of the church for you to drop that in. Um, if you have any special prayer concerns, there's a yellow card. We would love to pray for your concern if you want to drop that in the box as well. Just a few announcements this week. We have Bible study at 1 and 6.30. Hope to see you there. Our almost home collection this month is body wash and shampoo. 
by August 31st. This is crazy to think that it's August, mid-August. Where did the summer go? <laughs> and then we have Trinity 101 coming up soon if you are interested in learning a little bit about Trinity. Um, it is a membership class. If you're interested, doesn't mean you're joining, but if you would like to learn a little bit about the covenant and Trinity, um, there's a sign-up sheet on the table in the front of the, uh, in the uh, narthex of the church. And then please read through the rest of the announcements in your bulletin. Whatever challenges you are facing, I pray that you choose to navigate them with the knowledge that the presence of Jesus brings through the presence of peace. The peace Jesus offers is steadfast, both in the absence of trouble and in the midst of it. May we pass this peace through our words and our actions in a world that desperately needs to witness the fruits of the Prince of Peace. True peace, unshaken by circumstance, is found only through Jesus with us. This is why Jesus said, peace be with you. In other words, you can walk through anything knowing that I am peace and I am with you. Let us now pass this peace to each other. So I'm doing the verses. Okay. All right. Got it. Welcome to head back to your seats again. So we're gonna let you. Um, we're gonna let you sit for this one. Um, this is a song that's been out for a little while, uh, but I don't know how much it's been sung at Trinity. I don't think it's been sung since I've been here as pastor. Um, a song called Waymaker. And as we're talking about prayer, um, there's a line in this, uh, in the bridge that says, even when I don't see it, you're working. And there's times where we just don't, God, where are you? It doesn't seem like you're at work. It doesn't, it seems like our world is just going crazy. And this is a song sort of written in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of chaos, but the trusting that God is still working even when we can't see him at work. And so it's the same thing as when we talk about investing our time, investing our talents, investing our, our treasure into the ministry of Trinity. Um, it's a faith walk. Our lives are a faith walk and trusting God um, that he's going to take care of us when we are generous and when we're hospitable. And so... Um, as we sing this song, I, I, I pray that this would, would minister to you, but I also, as you catch on to it, it it's it, the, the, the chord progression, it's, it's repetitive, you should pick it up pretty quick, but um, yeah, let, would this be a prayer for you, especially if you're finding yourselves in the midst of a situation that's just real tough, this is a song for you this morning. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you. 
worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. So we're going to stay to our feet then and give God his praise. And the blessings that he's shown us. All blessings flow, praise Him, all creatures here below, praise Him above the heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Amen. You may be seated. Father God, it, it can seem like a contradiction to say, on one hand, we praise you because we acknowledge that all blessings flow from you. And at the same time, wondering, God, where are you? And some of us this morning, God, we confess that we're in that place of wondering, how long, God? How long must I wait? How long must I endure what I'm enduring? How long until the breakthrough happens, God? And we're grateful that we have the testimony of Scripture that gives us example after example of people doing that very thing of saying, how long? 
God, you, that you welcome that honesty from us. You, uh, you welcome that transparency from us. You welcome us to bring all of our brokenness and all of our challenges and all of our doubts and all of our questions to you because you're not afraid of those. You're not afraid of our stuff. You're not afraid of our baggage. You're not afraid of our past. But God, you are the father that welcomes home the prodigal with open arms. So God, might we feel your welcome this morning. God, we pray for those in our community that feel far away from you, that wonder if coming inside of a church is a good idea. Wonder how they'll be welcomed and wonder how um, they'll be invited in to be family. God, may we have your heart, your heart of hospitality, your heart of welcome, your heart of forgiveness and grace. God, may that be how people talk about us, not just on Sunday mornings, but on Monday morning and Friday morning and Wednesday morning and throughout the week, God. God, I think about some families of pastors who are grieving this week because they, they left us too soon, Lord. I think of Tom Mute, who's with you, a pastor of Covenant Youth of Alaska in Alaska that lost his fight to cancer. But as much as he lost his fight to cancer, he feels no more pain because he's with you this morning. Think about Will Stevens in Kansas City who died in a tragic car accident this end of this week whose family is just in a tailspin right now, Lord. While they might not be able to sense your comfort, Lord, we know that you are with their families. Because you have promised us, Jesus, that you will never leave us or forsake us. So God, help us to see how you're moving. Help us to feel your embrace that we might also share that grace and love and healing with those around us. And we know that we cannot do this without the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, we fix our eyes on you, praying the prayer, Jesus, that you taught us to pray, which begins, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture reading this week is from Psalms 4, verses 1 through 8. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever wondered when you pray, is there anybody that's actually listening to me? Is there anyone there who cares? Or is it just me in my car, or me in my house, or me, am I just talking to a brick wall? Or maybe you, you know in your mind that, yes, there is a God, and I've heard somewhere that God loves me, but it's different from knowing that God is listening and knowing with your heart that God hears you, that God hears our prayers. And I was thinking about, in the last week or so, as I was thinking about the series on prayer that we've been walking through, this Prayers of the People, that it's really easy for us to get tunnel vision on our own situations. Like when things are going great for me, it's sometimes it's hard to be mindful of, but there are some people that are just 
trying to get through today. And I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand up, but somebody in this room or watching online, that might be you. You might be wondering, like, I'm just trying to get through the time I lay my head down to go to sleep tonight. Or maybe I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. I don't know how I'm going to put food on the table tomorrow. And fortunately, when we find ourselves in those situations where we don't have a lot of reason for hope, where we don't have a lot of reason for confidence, we have the example of Scripture. We have the example of Scripture of people literally crying out to God. And so we're going to be in um, Psalm chapter 4 this morning. I want to encourage you, um, if you have a Bible, uh, keep it in front of you. There, there are Bibles in the pews. You can also pull our sermon notes, uh, sermon notes up on your phone in the events section of the YouVersion Bible app. But this is a tricky passage. When I picked this passage... About six weeks ago, I thought, oh, Psalm 4, that'll be a good one. And then when I actually got into it, there's a lot going on in this passage. So I want to break this down. But I, hopefully someone in the room, and maybe it's you to this morning, will hear something that you need to get it through today. So in chapter 4 of uh, the book of Psalms, verse 1, it says, Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. So I want to stop there. For some of us, prayer is awkward. We might have been taught certain prayers when we were growing up. Some of you might have like a regular prayer you say before bedtime or before meals. But when prayer comes from a formula to a conversation with a real living God, it's just different. It's just different. It's different from formulaically. And I'm not saying that there, aren't, there isn't value in prayers that are written down. Sometimes the structure and the, some of the words can help us out. But when you see David praying in Psalm 4. This is a prayer, not just that David used, but that all of God's people used. This is the songbook. You know, we just sung some songs this morning. Psalms was the songbook for God's people for centuries and centuries and centuries, and it covers the whole human experience. So when you get to verse 1, it's a little jarring. Answer me when I call to you can seem a little bit irreverent. If you've grown up in a, a ch- with a church background where you have very formal prayers to God, it almost sounds like somebody lecturing. Answer me when I talk to you, right? But it's a cry. This is someone who has been going through challenging circumstances for a long time. We're going to talk about why I say that. And so he's saying, God, are you listening to me? Answer me when I call to you. And he calls him a righteous God, so he has relationship. He knows who God is, but he says, God, answer me. I've been calling out to you. And I think the only way that David can pray like that is because he knows God. He knows that God is listening. If he didn't think God was real, if he didn't think that God was actually on the other side of this conversation, then why waste his breath? I'll give you an example, a real-life example. So I was reading an article this week as I was preparing for this sermon. And they used the example of someone that went to visit an orphanage. And it was an eerie situation because when they walked in the nursery portion of the orphanage with all of the babies who had been just given up or abandoned what was eerie about it it was there was no crying none of the babies cried in the nursery and some of you who have been parents are like that sounds awesome (laughs) that sounds awesome like no no crying but actually it's tragic Because a baby learns to, baby cries and learns to cry when they are in need. And they cry because they don't have the ability to speak. They just cry out because what they learn is that when they cry out, someone's going to respond. 
Someone's going to change their diaper. Someone's going to pick them up. Someone's going to feed them. Someone's going to take care of them. What these infants had learned in this orphanage is that there's no use crying because nobody's listening. These babies stopped crying because when they, whenever they would cry, no one would come to help them. Isn't that so tragic? So it's not a bad thing. I think, again, if you've grown, in a, grown up in a really formal kind of, um, well, I guess, proper church culture, sometimes crying out to God can feel sort of impolite or it can feel disrespectful. But actually, David models how we should be, that, that we have this relationship where we know when we cry out, our God is listening. He says, give me relief for my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. He, re- he needs mercy. My life, I'm in pain. I need some relief from what's going on in my life. Has anybody ever felt like that? Like day after day after day, God, I am in agony. Could you just... Show up just once, just for like an hour. I just need some relief. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. He doesn't say hear my prayer because he doesn't think God's listening. He says hear my prayer because he does know that God is listening. Matter of fact, Psalm 4 is just an example of something that you see throughout Scripture that the Bible normalizes lament. Lament, this idea of crying out to God when you are in anguish, that we are invited, we are even encouraged to cry out to God, to be real with God, to let God know this is how I really feel, not to like polish ourselves up or clean ourselves up. Sometimes when we come into a church, we feel like I got to have everything all proper and in the right place because I don't want to be rejected. And I understand that fear. That's a real concern. But God will not reject you. God has his arms wide open. And he invites us to cry out. And that when we feel those things, when we're going through those challenging, the valley of the shadow of death, that we should cry out. We shouldn't just be fake and pretend like, oh, you know, I'm really fine. My arm's falling off, but I'm fine. I'm bleeding profusely, but I'm fine. It's merely a flesh wound. Like, that's not being tough. That's being false. David invites us to be real with God, to be open and say, God, I'm hurting. Matter of fact, depending on how you count the Psalms, between a half and two-thirds of the Psalms, of the songbook of God's people, are lament. That's kind of strange, isn't it? If you think about how many songs do you feel like you have sung in church in your life that have been crying out to God because you're in pain? Most of them are like, everything's great, and God, you're great, and I feel great, and I'm having a great day, and praise God. And that's wonderful to give God praises and give God credit for the blessings. That's wonderful. But are we missing the opportunity to be real? We talk about a lot that this place is a hospital, It's not a museum. You go to a museum, they have people that their job is to dust everything and make sure everything looks so, so, make sure the paintings are all hanging the right way and in the right lighting and make sure all the appearances are all good. And it's like, no, 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 no. This is a place for broken people. And nobody in this room can say, I've gotten through life unscathed. Everybody in the room, myself included, has got demons that we are fighting. we got battles that we are fighting. We need help. This is what we were talking about last week. So, you know, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. The idea is that we're sheep. We need help. The idea of a sheep is that sheep are pretty much helpless without a shepherd guiding them. And I can confess. I'll be the first one to say, I need help. Now, goats, goats think they don't need help. Goats put on a good show and say, I I know where I'm going, until they get caught, or they they need somebody to rescue them. Sheep are just honest. We're just asking you to be honest. Be honest about your need for God, because I need God too. And so now we hear a little bit more about what is the problem. What What is David struggling through? You get to verse two, he says, how long... Will you people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Now, I want to 
say something right here. Because if I'm reading out of the NIV, and we have the NIV translation in the pews. If you're reading a different translation, you might say, well, my Bible doesn't say false gods. My Bible talks about um, falsehood or um, untruth, seeking you know, things that are false. But I think the NIV translators of this are on to something. Because the first part of it, how long will you people turn my glory into shame? What he's struggling with is he's got people discrediting him, dishonoring him, saying things about him that are simply not true to get people to count them out. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever had somebody say something about you that's not true? Spread rumors about you or gossip about you? or discredit you to, to bring you down. That's what's going on. So the, the first part of it is about David's honor, but the second question, how long will, your, will you love delusions and seek false gods, is about God's honor and God's glory. You might say, well, why, is, why are those two things together? Well, how we treat each other and how we connect with God are connected. If you read the Ten Commandments, go back through 1 through 10. Jesus sums them up, right? All of the law can be summed up by love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God and love people. They are connected. That means you cannot come in here on a Sunday morning and be like, praise God for whom all blessings flow. And then Monday morning you go to all your coworkers and say, you're a bunch of jerks. It doesn't work that way. You can't divide up your heart and be like, this is the part for God and this is the part for everybody else. And it happens all the time. In my experience of ministry, for all the conversations I've had with people who have given up on the church, or have walked away from the faith, 10 out of 10 times, it has nothing to do with what's written in this book. It has to do with people. It has to do with Christians that they know that don't walk the talk, or when they mess up, they're not honest about it. So on the one hand, they'll say, like, man, I love Jesus, and Jesus loves me, but apparently doesn't love you as much because I treat you like garbage whenever I see you, but, like, when I'm in church, like, and people see right through that, right? And somebody might be like, yeah, I, I know a person like that. <clears throat> and it's one thing to say I know a person like that. It's another thing to say, hey, if I'm honest, I am that person. If I'm honest... My love of God and my love for people don't always connect. Sometimes I have a segregated heart where this part gives praises and this part gives critique. God wants it to be together. But then the, the verse 3, he says, Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. And again, when you read that verse... If you're a little bit skeptical, and I, I understand if you're skeptical this morning, when you hear faithful service, that, that sounds a little arrogant sometimes. I am, the, I am God's faithful servant. But what he's saying is that he's trying. David's trying to follow God. He's trying to make his faith real. But more than that, he has this trust relationship with God where he knows by experience that God is listening to him. And so when you put verse 2 and verse 3 together, you see that in the midst of conflict and adversity, God is listening and aware. Now that is not always the easiest pill to swallow. Because sometimes when we're going through it, going through that situation of, that's really difficult or uh, we're not sure if we're going to make it. We're like, where is God? Why doesn't God do something about this? If God was a loving God, has anybody ever heard the sentence or maybe it's come out of your mouth? If God was a loving God, he would fill in the blanks. Sometimes it's hard to see 
God working? And sometimes people will come to me like, Pastor, I'm going through all this stuff. Where is God? And you know what I would say? That is above my pay grade. And if you ever have a pastor say, well, I can tell you by, with confidence that God is doing this in your life. I'm like, wow. They must have an insight into God's mind that I don't have. There's just the reality that there's just stuff going on. There's God is at work in ways that none of us are privy to. It's just too big. God's plan and God's work and God's activity is, is, is so much more. I am such a little, each of us have such a small perspective of everything that's happening in the world. Like, do you know everything that's happening on Pulaski Road right now as we're sitting here? I don't, and I can see the cars driving by. But God does. God knows what's happening inside every vehicle driving through the Chicago metro. That's a lot of cars. Through the whole world at the same time. So I don't really feel like I'm qualified to tell you exactly. I can give you some idea hey, it sounds like God might be doing this. I can, God might be working in this way, but I don't know for sure. But what I do know is that God is present. I don't know what he's present doing, and he's listening. So even where it's like, when we talk about prayer, we were talking about this in a Bible study on Wednesday. I said, you know, I'd love for us to have a goal. As we're talking about prayer for the month of August, like, have a goal. Like, I want to get to know, I want to improve my relationship with God in this way, or I want to improve my prayer life in this way, and then I'm going to take these steps to move in that direction. I want to put some work in. It's just like anything else. Prayer is just like any other habit. It takes t- time and investment. But sometimes, when we talk about prayer, or like, I'm going to sit with God. Okay, sit with God for like 10 seconds. <laughs> oh, I'm too distracted. I, this is no good. And I mean, imagine that. Imagine if you went to the gym tomorrow morning and you got on the treadmill and you hit go and you started running for like 10 seconds. Oh, didn't lose any weight. I guess I'm done. And you walked away. Nobody would do that, right? Because we know it takes, you have to build up. It takes time. It's a lot of discipline. And again, like discipline is not necessarily a, a word that we like. But anything worth anything in our, in our lives and in our world takes a little bit of effort and focus and determination. And so God wants us to have this intimacy, this conversation with him, but it, it takes time. And we're not always going to get it right. But I'll tell you, no matter what's going on in your life today, God is listening to you. Your prayers are not just hitting the brick wall and falling to the ground. Your prayers are being heard. God is just maybe working in a way that you can't see, and I can't see it either. Even if I don't see it, you're working. That's truth. But it takes faith. It takes knowing who God is, and that takes time. Just like getting to know anybody that you would, that you would meet, any friendship or any relationship, it takes time to put in, the, to put in uh, that relationship-building effort. So he's experiencing this conflict, he's experiencing the adversity, and then we get to verse 4. And he's, he's now, he's, he kind of goes back to talking to God and then talking to the people that he are, are giving him a hard time. And he says this to the people who are giving him a hard time in verse 4. Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your bed, search your heart and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. That says a lot to me. Because David could have said a lot of other things. Think about when somebody has been coming at you or spreading falsehood about you or giving you a hard time or making your life difficult. Is your first thought, well, I should pray for them. I should really pray that they experience God's transforming power. I'm going to pray that God changes their heart. I'm going to pray that they are able to experience God in a way that they can trust in the Lord. Is that your first response? 
I think many of us would rather pray like, God, would you just take care of them? Would you just wipe them out? Would you make their lives miserable? Because I deserve it. I deserve a little revenge. I deserve a little vengeance. We want, that's our, our human response is when people are coming against us, we just want to get them out of there. But David models something for us. He models this heartbeat of reconciliation. And this is not natural. You know, when you talk about, you probably many of you have heard of the eye, eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth. And I've heard people say, well, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind and we know we shouldn't. But what God was trying to do in the Old Testament was, was sort of settle things down. Because what would happen is somebody would go to the next town over and kill somebody. And then that, somebody from this town would bring 10 more people and kill 20 people. And then those, they bring 50 people and, and you know, just escalate, escalate, escalate. And God's like, you guys got to put an end to this conflict. And we have it in our families, right? We have it in our friendships. We might have it in the place that we work. These conflicts that seemingly are unending, are endless. And God's heart is always reconciliation. But in order to get there, it starts with us. I think oftentimes when someone's got a problem with us, it's like, well, let's take care of them first and then I'll forgive them. Once they, and, and we don't always do the work. We're, it's easier, a lot easier for us to look out and to look at everyone else and see everybody else's faults and everybody else's problems and everybody else's dysfunctions, everybody else's dis, uh, addictions. It's a lot more difficult to say, but what is my stuff? And so Jesus gives us this, this picture in the book of Matthew. He says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Let me give you the picture in case you don't get it. It'd be like if I have a telephone pole sticking out of my face where my right eye should be, and I'm looking at the back row at Kevin McGrath and saying, hey, Kevin, I think you got something in your eye. Well, that'd be pretty impossible to see with the telephone pole. But we do that, right? It's way easier for us to be like, eh, I'm not sure about you, or I don't really like the way you look, or I don't really like the way you talk, or I don't really like the way fill in the blank. But what about us? What about our stuff? What do we need to work on? How do we treat people? And that's a harder question. It's a harder question to go to somebody you trust and give them permission to say, hey, how am I doing? <laughs> what do I need to work on? That's a, that's a scary question to ask somebody because you might, they might answer it. Well, Tom, take a seat. It's going to be about three hours. I'm going to tell you all the stuff you got to work on. That might, that might happen. But are we willing to have the courage to do that hard work before we lash out, before we try to get our revenge, before we try to get even? Are we willing to do that deep heart work and to pray, to invite God in? Because ultimately, we're called to reconciliation and restoration rather than vengeance. The Bible says vengeance is mine, not mine. It's the Lord's. We want to handle it ourselves. We want to, let me just take care of business. Let me just, you smacked me, let me punch you. That's, and maybe not physically, but with words or with gossip or with tearing people down with our friends. And that's just not what's modeled for us in Scripture. And we see it all the time. We justify it. It's like, well, but if you knew what they did, it would be okay. And what I said, that baloney. Remember when the woman caught in adultery was drugged before Jesus and all the Pharisees had the rocks. Jesus said, okay, the first one without sin, you can throw the first stone. What happened? They dropped their stones and walked away. And if, if you notice, if you go back and read that scripture in the Gospels, it's the older ones who dropped them first and walked away. Well, why the older ones? Because they had the life experience. They know full well. Yeah, I'm not perfect. I got no, I got no place to judge. That word pierced their heart. Sometimes when you don't have all those life experiences, you can have blinders on and be cocky and say, hey, I'm great. I'm doing great. I, there's nothing wrong with me. And it's, I don't have anything to work on. I'm just perfect. And it's like, nope. 
Are we willing to have that divine self-awareness to do that interior work? Are we, in our prayer life, are we willing to invite God to do this hard work so that we can be people of reconciliation? Could you imagine how different just Oak Lawn, let's not even take the world, let's just keep it small scale. If all of the churches in Oak Lawn said that our number one thing we're going to do is love people, welcome people, and forgive people. That's our goal for 2024 and 2025. That's our mission statement. We're going to love people, we're going to welcome people, and we're going to forgive people. That's going to be our job as a church. Could you imagine every church, no matter what denomination, just did that, how different it would be? But we don't, right? Matter of fact, so often pastors get seduced in like looking at the other churches as competition. How many you got at your church? How many, well, I got this many. Well, we do. How many services do you have? And how much, how big's your budget? How big's your building? And how, how big's your youth program? And how many kids did you send to camp? And all this kind of stuff. And it's baloney. That's not the way of Jesus. That's the way of our culture. We're called to be different. We're called to be different. We're called to be people of reconciliation and restoration. Restoration means that we're about what can I do to, to restore this relationship. Now, you might, it might be just beyond your control. You might be in a relationship or a friendship that's just broken, and you've done everything you can on, on your part. And at that point, You've done your part. But a lot of times, we want to wait for the other person to go first. Yeah, I'll make up, but you go first. You say, I'm sorry first, and then I'll say, I'm sorry. But we got to lead. we got to be the ones to start this thing. That's the only way this works. And so you see this idea carry on into verse 6 and verse 7. He says, many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? May the light of your face shine on us. Now, we don't really know who the many are. They very well might be the people that are giving David a hard time. But notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say when they're asking like, hey, we want to be prosper. We want to have more money in our bank accounts. We want to have food in our stomachs. David doesn't say, hey, Lord, give them what they deserve. Take care of them. He says, no. Shine your light on them. Show them how good you are. I want even my enemies to know you. That's the heart of David, that all would come to know. Now, we know that's probably not going to happen, but that's his heartbeat. He's not trying to, to keep the grudge. He's saying, hey, if that's what they want, Lord, show yourself. Show your goodness to them. Show your faithfulness to them. And then it continues on in verse 7, then fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. David's like, man, would it be awesome for all of my friends who won't acknowledge God that God blesses them anyway? And through that blessing, they go, oh, wow, how did I get blessed? And they start worshiping God. David's like, nothing would make me happier than to see all of these people who are against God turn their hearts to God to know them and experience this relationship. That is the heart that we should have. It's not just about us. It's not make me joyful and make them miserable. It's about being kingdom people. That people might know the Lord, that people's lives might be transformed, whether they're our friends or our enemies. That the more people who come to know Jesus and have their hearts transformed by the love of Jesus, then the better our world is going to be. Amen? I mean, there's a picture in Revelation chapter 7, it's beautiful. It says there's representatives from every tribe, language, and nation on earth. And a number that no one could count. There's so many coming together in unity to worship Jesus. That's what we're shooting for. That's what this is an appetizer for. We are trying to, to just begin to be an example of what this kind of unity can look like. Because that kind of transformational love will change the world. And I might say, well, that sounds very aspirational, Tom. But you know what? You got two choices. You can turn on your TV and turn on your news and just be depressed and complain. Or you can roll up your sleeves with the love of Jesus and start being the answer to some of these problems. 
You know, sometimes, sometimes, sorry, I'm preaching a little bit this morning, but, you know, sometimes people say, well, if God was loving, why doesn't he do this? And sometimes I ask, well, maybe he's waiting on you to be the answer to that prayer. Sometimes he's waiting on you to step up and take care of that and be a part of that healing. Sometimes we just want God to be like, boop, and just like fix things, but that's God invites us to participate in his project of global ministry. And it starts right here in our backyards. God wants to involve us. Isn't that great? Could you imagine? Think about yourself. That God would say, I really want you to represent me. Now, I bet you would, for many of us, no uh, government, whoever, what office they're running for, whatever party, we're probably not going to get on any poster boards for anybody's election. But Jesus is like, I want your face on my poster. As someone who's been redeemed and saved and transformed by the love of Jesus, that Jesus says, yeah, I do want each of you. Incredible stuff. And ultimately, David understands that whether he receives the blessing or his friends receive the blessing, that our provision and our sustenance come from God. So that house you live in, that raise you got, that job that you got, that food that was in your stomach, it might have come from a person, it might have come from a paycheck, but ultimately it comes from God. God opens those doors. And so because God is at work and because God is doing the heavy lifting, we get to verse 8. He says, In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. Has anybody ever had a hard time going to sleep at night because there's just so much going on up here? You're just so anxious. You got so much on your mind. You got so many responsibilities. You got problems that you're not sure what the solutions are, and you just toss and turn. I've been there a lot. But when we can get to the point where ultimately we can say, you know what? I don't have all the power in the world to handle all those things. I got to trust that God is in control. That God's faithful, that when we sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow, that we, we can sing that when we have great abundance, and we can sing that when we don't know where our next meal is going to come from, but we just have this sense that God is who God is. God is faithful. God walks with us in all the, the peaks and the valleys. And he's the one that's going to take care of us. That we can rest in the Lord when we understand his faithful character. When you know, not just know God, when you know God and know what kind of God, when you have that history of God's faithfulness, that you can rest. There's nothing more sweet than being able to say, God's got this handled. God's got this taken care of. So as we wrap up this morning, I just got three questions and then we'll, we'll, we'll finish up with a, a song just crying out to God. First of all, what role does, or how does lament play a role in your relationship with God? Do you allow yourself to be that real with God, to be that honest with God when you're struggling, when you're going through it? Do you cry out to God with just language that you would use with your best friend? Do you say, God, where are you? I need you. You are invited to be that vulnerable, that real with God. But what what role does that play? Because you don't have to have it all together. Second, What role does prayer play in your conflict resolution? And I know it's not natural because when somebody does something in the spur of the moment, our reaction is to get them back. It's to handle it. When somebody insults us, man, is it hard to not just, just bring one back. Even harder. But have you invited God into the middle of the conflicts of your life and say, God, I can't change anybody's heart. Matter of fact, if I get in a shouting match, I'm probably just going to make the other person's heart harder and make there be less of a chance that we're ever going to fix this thing between us. 
But are we willing to invite God into the middle of our dysfunctional relationships so that he can do his work? And do you pray for the people who give you a hard time? Do they make your prayer list? The people who just drive you crazy? The people who make your life miserable? Do you pray for them? And not just pray, Lord, I pray that you just take care of them, Lord, but like, Lord, would you just show them your goodness that they might be changed? Do we trust God like that? And finally, how are you able to rest in God? Can you get to the point where you can kick your feet up and say, God's got this. There's nothing more that I can do. There's nothing more that I can say. I'm going to give this to God and let God do it. And if you never rest, this is, again, this is a countercultural thing. We are... We prop up people who work all the time and are busy, busy, busy. Oh, you're so busy. You work so hard. But even God took a rest, right? After he created, he modeled Sabbath for us, resting for a day. And I realize sometimes it's hard for us to to do that, but maybe it's not a day, but do you find times, even if it's just an hour here and there, where you can say, God, I just want to rest in you, trusting that you got things handled. Can you do that? So, Father, this morning, as we come together, as we prepare to go and enjoy some some coffee and some treats and time of fellowship and then head on our way, would we be honest with ourselves and honest with you that we need you? Will you be more like sheep than goats? Will we not be so stubborn that we we don't try to handle all of life's problems on our own strength or in our own power and our own resources, but that we rest in you because we've come to know you in such a way where we can trust you. Help us to experience you as that gracious, loving Father who always welcomes us back who always has our best in mind. Meet us here this morning, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Would you stand with us as we sing our closing song this morning? Lord, I come, I confess, Bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found, is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. is Christ in me. Where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one my righteousness oh god how i need you so teach my song to rise to you 
when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand or fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand or fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you, you're my one defense. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. So friends, as you go, how do you be real with God? To welcome him into all of your life, the broken places, the twisted up places that you might find life. And then may you take that life and that joy and spread it to be an agent of God's reconciliation in our world. Go in his power and peace and enjoy some coffee and treats. Amen. Two weeks from now? Yeah. Yeah, we can do it. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Good to see you guys. When do you go back to school? Oh, man. It's coming. Enjoy your break for a little bit. <laughs> good to see you guys. Take care.